I, I set out to find the answers rather naively for myself. This wasn't any great quest. I've always had a curious mind. Down the years, I've found some of the answers, or I, I, I believe I have. But there's still a few that I'm looking for. My name is Philip Mantle, and I've been involved in UFO research for 40 years. My interest in the UFO subject began when I was at high school. My mum was originally from a rural part of Northern Ireland. And as a youngster, she'd always told us about when she met a fairy on the farm where they lived. You know, this was very real, wasn't a fantasy. And uh, I think that probably spurred a bit of interest. Uh, I was interested in all things paranormal. And just by chance, right literally, the opposite side of the road from us was my best friend's grandmother. And uh, she used to go to the spiritualist church. So I think when I was about 13, 14, that kind of age, I used to go with her. And I found it fascinating. I didn't necessarily agree with what they were, were talking about, but I found it fascinating. So I began to read about all things uh, paranormal, uh, and one of which was, of course, UFOs. But then I was also interested in astronomy, the space race, and so on. And I read a, a, a chapter in a book about UFOs that basically dismissed it, but nonetheless it intrigued me. So it was, wasn't any one thing, it was kind of a number of things. And rather naively, I thought if, if, if I read the odd book or two or a magazine here and there, I'll, I'll, I'll find out everything I, I need. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that wasn't to be. I did expect at some point that there would be a eureka moment, if you like, and I'd have all the answers. I, I, I believe I've found some of them, but by no means all of them. My aunt, who lived just round the corner, brought me the local evening newspaper, which was from Leeds. And there was a small advertisement in it for a meeting of the Yorkshire UFO Society. And I thought, these will be the gentlemen that can provide me with the answers I'm looking for. But um, that was 40 years ago. So <laughs> here I am still, still asking those questions. I was formerly the director of investigations for the British UFO Research Association, and I was also the MUFON representative for England at one point. When you join a UFO group, there is a, a, a wide mixture of beliefs. I mean, some people there are out and out believers. Those, those like me who knew absolutely nothing, because I didn't, I'd, I'd read a few books and that was it. There's also a few skeptics mixed in who think there's something interesting behind it, but it's not necessarily anything to do with extraterrestrials or aliens. I think there's more of a, a, a more down-to-earth explanation. You have to have a certain degree of skepticism to begin with, but healthy skepticism. There's a difference between skeptical and debunker. Debunker will just say, it cannot be, therefore it isn't, and dismiss it. A skeptic will say, well, I think there may be something to it, but I need to, I need to prove it first or disprove it. So whenever someone reports a sighting to me or sends me a piece of film or a photograph, you know that the chances are that there's an answer to it. It's just a question of finding it. Some are quite obvious because you know at certain times of year they've got bright stars and planets and some people will misidentify them. If somebody said it had red and green flashing lights on it, it's more than likely to be an aeroplane, and so on. Uh, there are a few hoaxes, you know, mixed in for good measure. But out of all of this, every now and again, there is a little gem that comes along. There's a little nugget that is not that easy to explain. And I can be as skeptical as, as anyone. And you put that skeptical head on and you think, well, I'll try my damnedest to get to the bottom of this. But sometimes you just have to hold your hands up and say, well, I've done my best and I, I can't find an explanation and, and, and leave it at that. Uh, and, I, and I look upon a, a role as, an, as a UFO investigator is to document this information as the best way you can. And hopefully 
the, the accumulated documentation and research will then lead to answers. So during that 40 years, you know, I've, I've, I've researched and investigated UFO cases of every description, really. Probably best known for my involvement in the alien autopsy film. There's many different types of UFO reports or close encounters, as perhaps might be better known. The most common, of course, is what we would call lights in the sky. Strange lights seen at a distance or close up. Most of these sightings can be explained away relatively easily as astronomical bodies, aircraft, and so on. But there are some, like those that came from uh, around the Yorkshire Dales, that, that were clearly not uh, aircraft or the planet Venus. Then we have the more sort of detailed sightings of something up close and personal. It's not a little light in the distance. It seems to be a, a structured vehicle of some kind, and it's viewed at, at close range. And of course, they are the the real close encounters where people claim not only to have seen a UFO, but they're maybe their occupants, um, the aliens, if you want to call them that. They may have interacted with these beings in some way. And of course, there are those that claim to have been physically abducted by the aliens. Um, so there's a wide variety of, of different types of reports. A UFO investigator is someone they turn to when all other avenues have, have seemed to be a dead end. Tonight we have left the uh, political arena for the arena where men's minds and imagination take over from established facts and provable theories. We're going to examine that unfathomable area of outer space. The one that started it all off happened on June the 24th, 1947 when private pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying over the Cascade Mountains in, in Washington. He was actually looking for a crashed aircraft himself at the time. This was in daylight, and there was a bright flash that illuminated his, his canopy. And he looked out between the mountain peaks, and he saw a formation, a V formation of objects that had no wings, no tail, no fuselage, no propellers, no jets, and he timed them between the two mountain peaks. And when he worked out how quickly they'd flown, they, they were going faster than any known aircraft at the time. Between Chehalis and Yakima in the state of Washington, private pilot Kenneth Arnold sighted nine saucer-like things flying like geese in a chain-like line. He estimated the speed of the saucers at 1,200 miles per hour. Now, when Kenneth Arnold landed, he reported the incident to a local newsman. And he asked him how these strange objects maneuvered through the skies. So I, I told him, I says, well, they flew very erratically, like boats on rough water, or uh, I said, uh, uh, very, you know, they would skip and sail and, and give off these flashes. And uh, I said, or they could fly, I could say maybe they, you take a saucer and you skip it across the water and it, it's erratic. However, I did not say they were saucer shaped and hey presto, flying saucers were born. If we come to the UK, without question, the most famous incident here happened in Rendlesham Forest in late December 1980. Rendlesham Forest lies between the twin RAF bases of Woodbridge and Bentwaters. And although they were RAF bases, they were uh, on loan or leased, if you like, to the United States Air Force, and they were uh, a nuclear facility. And over a period of two or three nights in late December 1980, a number of things are claimed to have been seen in the forest by personnel from the base, uh, one of which was the deputy base commander, Lieutenant Colonel Holt, who went on the record and reported it in writing. And he also had a tape recording that he made on one of these nights while he viewed the UFOs in the forest. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. 
The two pieces of the tuning off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. Oh, here, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. But perhaps the most famous and best known UFO case in the world, it goes back again to 1947, just following in the wake of Kenneth Arnold, and it's the UFO crash at Roswell in New Mexico. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. It's the one case that will not die. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. It is claimed that not only a UFO crashed, but there were dead alien bodies. It's rumored that perhaps one of those creatures on board did survive for a short period of time. It's the case that will not die. It is shrouded in mystery. And even now, all those that, that were at Roswell or, or saw something around the time have all passed away. However, information still comes to light. It's lying in somebody's files or in a cupboard or, you know, in the attic in a box. You know, just when you think you've heard everything there is to know about Roswell, Something pops up and bites you on the backside. It really does. The town of Roswell was in the middle of the desert in New Mexico. And its main employer was the Roswell Army Air Force Base that was nearby. And one night in, in early July, there was a, a lightning storm. And the next day, on a sheep rancher's property, a chap called Matt Brazel came out to inspect his sheep one day and found this wreckage across his land. The sheep wouldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, he'd never seen this, this type of material before. He didn't have a telephone. He didn't even have electricity on his ranch. So he took some of this material to his, his neighbour. A lady by the name of Loretta Proctor at a nearby ranch and she advised him to take it into the town. She said it might be something to do with the military. So he waited a few days uh, until he had to go into town for something and he gathered some of this material up and took it to the sheriff. And that was Sheriff George Wilcox. Uh, again, Sheriff Wilcox had never seen anything like it. So we put in a phone call to the Roswell Army Air Force, uh, which seemed the obvious thing for him to do. I was called to headquarters was given copies of a press release which stated in essence that we had in our possession a flying disc. I was told to hand deliver to the uh, four news media we had in town at that time. We had two radio stations and two newspapers. A roundup of the latest developments in the finding of a flying disc. An eyewitness report of that, of course, then went out on the wire service, the local radio covered it, and the story shot around the world. You know, the sheriff did say we're getting phone calls from, you know, all four corners of the globe. So that's how we got to know about it, not through uh, uh, any unofficial statement, but from an official press release. Within hours, in fact, the next newspaper the following day, they retracted that, said, sorry, big mistake. It was a weather blown. Everybody believed it, that it was a weather balloon. The way it was handled, it was a real slick way of say, yes, we've got a flying saucer, and then have a general who is much more knowledgeable, naturally, say, no, that was a new type of weather balloon. Well, the balloons that they used were quite straightforward and simple, checking for the various weather conditions because they flew aircraft in and out of the base. They needed to know what was happening. So rather than rely on anyone else, they used to do it for themselves. It was common procedure. 
The Roswell Army Air Force housed what is known as the 509th Bomb Group, and they were the only atomic bomb wing in the world. It was the 509th, for example, that dropped the atomic bombs on Japan to end the Second World War. So this wasn't some little, you know, air base stuck out in the middle of nowhere. It was a very important installation. very different world than we have here today. There was very real fear that the US and the Soviet Union were heading for war and that, that war would be a nuclear war. So there was still a great respect for officialdom, certainly in the military. Both the US and the USSR in, in opposite direction were keeping tabs on each other. Uh, we know that the atomic bomb was designed and invented in the United States. However, the secrets were leaked to the, uh, to the Soviets, so they did have uh, atomic bombs, uh, and the US were keeping a close eye on them the best they could. So tensions were very real uh, in 1947, and there were many who suspected that, that you know, war could well be imminent. Primarily, if the military said something was so-and-so, then you'd probably believe them. A lot of people in the town may have even served in the military at one point. The town depended on the airbase for its living you know, during those days. It certainly did have a, an, an effect. After the telephone call went to the airbase from the sheriff, they dispatched their intelligence officer, which was Lieutenant Jesse Marcel. He took with him a, a gentleman called Sheridan Cabot and they made their way out to the Brazel Ranch and collected some of this material. And on the way back, Marcel stopped at his home. He didn't live on the base, they lived off base with his wife and his 11-year-old uh, son, Jesse Marcel Jr. When he came in, he was very excited. He woke my mother and myself up. It must have been one or two o'clock in the morning and he wanted us to see what he was bringing in from the field. He said, this is parts of a flying saucer. And uh, it was all brought in and spread out on the kitchen floor. And uh, we just looked at it. Young Marcel picked up a, a rod about this long that looked edge on like a capital letter I. So it got the nickname of an I beam. You know, I, I picked up this particular I beam and held it up to my upper left to look at it with the kitchen light reflecting on the inner surface. And that's when I saw the, uh, the writing or the symbol of some sort. I thought at first, this is hieroglyphics or some kind of writing like that. It certainly looked alien to me. And his father said, son, you may be the first person to ever see writing from another world. He gathered the stuff up and took it back to the base. There are some people, even today, who say, well, you know, the military did make a mistake, and, and it was indeed simply a balloon, um, but attached to a secret project. Uh, hence, uh, you know, the reason for keeping it quiet. You go back to Major Marcel himself, they used to release weather balloons twice a day from the Air Force base. He'd been trained in how to do this. He knew what a weather balloon looked like, and he said, that material that I posed for in his office was a weather balloon, but that wasn't the material that I picked up that day on the ranch. He claimed that there'd been a switch, and he was told to keep quiet and say nothing. It's very difficult to say how the military reacted at the time. Certainly, you know, Major Marcel, who had handled this material, seemed more curious than scared. Why the cover-up was put into place is still hotly debated. But you have to remember, this is just after the Second World War, so people were used to keeping secrets, and the nature of the airbase itself, it was a, 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 a nuclear facility. So, you know, secrets were part of everyday routine. The US government have changed 
their opinion on what happened at Roswell on a number of occasions. They had Major Marcel pose in his commanding officer's office with the wreckage of a weather balloon. And they allowed the various journalists in to take photographs of it. So it was a big fuss about nothing, thank you very much. And the story literally died overnight. I sincerely believe we had the crash of something from outer space because we still don't have materials that compare with the descriptions I've gotten of the material that was picked up out on the ranch and brought into town. He couldn't figure this out. There were some other bits and pieces, the likes of which he'd never seen before. This was the puzzling thing. They, 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 they had seen weather balloons and things of that nature, but nothing like this at all. I think at last count, I had spoken to around four dozen people who, who handled various aspects of the debris. The most dramatic is the foil-like material that you can wad up in a ball and let it go and it would unfold itself. Matt Brazel, like Sheriff Wilcox and others, claimed that some of this material was almost, almost looked like tin foil. But it was very light, and when you, you rolled it up or crushed it in your hand and then let go again, it would immediately unfurl and go back to its original shape without any creases or bents or dints and it got the nickname of memory metal. Oh. They tried to burn it and they couldn't burn it. It wouldn't catch on fire and they took out their pocket knives and they tried to cut it and they couldn't cut it. And I guess they all had their chance to play with it for a while and it was laying on the table so I reached over and picked it up. And I played for it probably about five minutes. When you would wad it up in your hand, you couldn't feel it in your hand. You couldn't feel you had anything there and it would go to a size that was so small that you'd have to look to see if it was still in your hand. And then when you drop it, it spread out all over the table. Some of it you could crush and it would just spring back. However, Jesse Marcel said they found other parts of it that you could hit with a sledgehammer, couldn't put a dent in it at all. And then there were the eye beams with this strange purplish hieroglyphic writing on it. There are those, of course, not Jesse Marcel, who said that this was just part of the wreckage, that the actual main body of the craft was found some miles away. And there was the UFO, complete with its, its, its dead occupants and all the contents therein. Daddy came in so excited, and he said, what they saw was not from this world. There were two bodies that were laying on the ground outside of this craft, and that there was one, what he called, little person. And he said, there's one little person that was walking around. And he said, they were still alive. And he said that the other two were dead, and that this one that was alive was very sad. My dad would not have gotten excited over a weather balloon. He was not easily excitable. And this is the most thrill I'd ever seen him. He thought that was the most fantastic thing in the world. Many years after this, an investigation was conducted by the United States Air Force. And they came out again and said, well, it really was with the balloons but this time it was attached to a secret project, and that was codenamed Mogul. The balloons weren't secret, neither was the equipment that they used, but the, what they were being used for was secret. Basically, Project Mogul had an array suspended underneath some weather balloons that was launched into the upper atmosphere, and it was testing for Soviet nuclear tests, looking for atomic waste in the, in the upper atmosphere. And they claimed that it was one of these with its various bits and pieces that crashed on the Brazil ranch. It's just unfortunate that none were launched on the days in question and they were all accounted for. And it was still just a weather balloon. There was nothing secret about it, you know, and they used to launch the weather balloons twice a day from Roswell Army Air Force. 
So, you know, they changed the story some way. It wasn't just a, an ordinary weather balloon, it was Project Melville, which was still just a weather balloon. And it didn't seem to fit the description given by the witnesses. There is one problem, and the fact that there are those eyewitnesses that claimed that they found the main body of the wreckage, the UFO, and therein were bodies, creatures, beings, aliens, call them what you will. But the United States military denied that any bodies could have been found because it was a weather balloon. Then, when they did their official report back in the 90s and said it was Project Mogul, they added a caveat to that and said, we have an explanation for the bodies. Bear in mind that always denied that any bodies were associated with the crash and that these were anthropomorphic dummies made of wood that were used primarily for parachute testing. Now, the only problem with that is that, yes, they did use these dummies for such purposes, but they weren't used until the early 1950s, some five years after the Roswell crash had actually happened. So they kind of, you know, made a, a bit of a mistake there, I, would, I might add. But it was the first time that they'd actually come up with an explanation for the alleged alien bodies. What is claimed about the, the Roswell crash is that, you know, the military acted very, very swiftly and they were sent in to literally clean up the area, remove every piece of debris, every piece of wreckage, any sign that anything had happened there. And that's what they did and took everything. Even, you know, Matt Brazel wasn't allowed to keep any of this material. It is claimed that the cover-up began right from day one. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmer's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. It's been argued that, well, surely the US military would have released the information. Why would they cover it up? But there are those that go back in time, not that far, to the 1930s, when uh, actor and producer and director Orson Welles uh, staged a radio play based on the H.G. Wells short story, War of the Worlds. Wait a minute, something's happening. Pump shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror that leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Oh, Lord, they're turning into flames. Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. People thought we were literally being invaded by Martians. According to reports at the time, people did get quite hysterical. There was allegedly a number of suicides, but it was made quite clear it was a, a, a drama, but some people who tuned in perhaps a bit later on got fooled by this. So that's often been used as an argument of why that perhaps the military kept the lid on the Roswell UFO crash was simply for fear of public hysteria. And he went on TV later and apologized. Of course, you're deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. The date of the broadcast, date of the broadcast was 1939, and it seemed, came rather as a great surprise to us that a story, fine H.G. Wells classic fantasy, the original for so many succeeding comic strips and adventure stories and novels about a mythical invasion by monsters from the planet Mars should have had so 
profound an effect upon radio listeners. Were you aware that terror was going on throughout oh, the no. nation? Oh, no. Of course not. No. <laughs> we did Dracula, and uh, it seemed to me during Dracula I had high hopes that people would uh, react as they do in a movie yeah. uh, of that kind, and uh, uh, I don't know that they did particularly, and uh, so I've given up. One doesn't believe in the radio audience much. You don't know that they're, whether they're listening or not. You have no idea how many people are listening or what they're thinking. I had every hope that, uh, that the people would be excited as they would be at a melodrama. I don't believe that I have since. It is not a method original with me. It is used by many radio programs. Uh, I am terribly shocked by the effect it's had. I do not believe that the method is original with me or, or peculiar to the Mercury Theater's presentation. When you go back to Roswell and look at the, the various eyewitnesses, not many of them stepped forward at that time in 1947, uh, simply because there was no avenue for them to do so. It wasn't until some years later, when in the late 1970s, nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman met Colonel Marcel. He was in retirement now. And he was introduced to him by a TV station who knew about his story. Then the word got out. Roswell became news. It was featured in television and newspapers and so on. And it's only when that happened then other people who were there at the time stepped forward. Some went on the record, others, you know, in confidence. Some were also found by UFO researchers. They'd look who was serving in the military at the air base at that time and, and were able to track them down and find them. So many of the airmen and civilian witnesses as well went on the record. So the investigation to Roswell started in earnest in the late 1970s uh, and it's still ongoing even today. There's been lots of first-hand witnesses from the military go on the record. Even young Marcel himself, he became a doctor, a medical doctor and a flight surgeon, served in the military himself. He's gone on the record, wrote his own book about it, spoke at conferences. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, so a lot of the people who were there are the first or second hand stepped forward. There is this threatening aspect of, of the Roswell story, but again, we have to remember, it was a different era and a different time. So there were those, certainly in the military, if they were told to keep quiet, then they would do exactly that. That was their duty, and that's the way they were trained, and that's the way that they acted. A number of the military witnesses didn't go on the record for a long time, perhaps when they were in the twilight of their own life. And they thought, well, if I don't say something now, then I'll never have the opportunity. Uh, and that seems to be in the case in, uh, you know, on a number of occasions. The best evidence we have from a number of eyewitness sources is that the craft and the bodies were brought to Hangar 84 on the Roswell Army Airfield and stored overnight before transport. What we understand from the eyewitness testimony is the bodies were sealed in a large wooden crate uh, kept at the center of the hangar. It's absolutely brilliant what they did. They, they announced they have a flying saucer, but they've already captured it. They've already got it. There's nothing to see, so nobody goes out looking for the thing. Then they shift everything to Fort Worth. The higher headquarters says, no, no, those guys made a mistake with just a weather balloon. One of the sinister things about the Roswell affair is that there are claims that the military not only ordered the people under their command to stay quiet, but also civilian witnesses. The press can't find Jesse Marcel because he's in Fort Worth and he's been silenced. You know, when he came back from Carswell after flying the debris, he did tell me not to talk about this, told my mother not to talk about this. This is a non-event. Play like it never happened. Don't even talk about this with your friends, which I didn't. And uh, he, years later, he confided that he was actually part of the cover-up because he uh, went along with the Air Force explanation even though he knew full well that that was not true. There's corroborative testimony that suggests somebody was putting pressure on people to silence them, and they used what means were necessary to keep those people silent. With some of the civilians, it was, they were told that if you ever talk about it, you will be killed. For example, a lady by the name of Frankie Rowe, 
Her father was a firefighter. He's claimed that they were dispatched to the event and he managed to somehow acquire a piece of this memory metal and show it to her. You know, she was his daughter. Shortly afterwards, they were visited by members of the military uh, with a stern warning, and I mean a very stern warning, that keep quiet about this and say nothing. You know, bullets are cheap, so to speak. I said, yes, I did handle it. And he started emphasizing, no, you didn't. Well, my mother was pretty strict, and we didn't lie. So I'm insistent that, yes, I saw it, yes, I held it. And he got mad, and he got louder. And he had one of those, looks like a small baseball bat that hooks on the side of your belt. And he took that out, and he's holding it, and he starts beating his hand. Every time he said something, he would hit that on his hand. And he would say, I want you to understand, you were never there. You did not see anything. You did not hear a conversation. And he said, if you can't understand this, there are things that we can do. He said, we could take you out here in the middle of this desert. He said, this is a big desert here. He said, no one will ever find your bodies, ever. No one will ever know what happened to you. He said, the only way I'm going to let you stay around or live as if you promise you'll never talk about this the rest of your life. So I told him I wouldn't. And that was a reoccurring theme every now and again, both with civilian and military witnesses. The wreckage at the time, uh, and it even says this in the, in the newspaper cuttings, was flown to Wright Field, as it was called, and it's now called Wright Patterson Air Force Base, still in operation. And it's claimed that that is where the wreckage and possibly even the, the, the bodies were studied, officially studied. Uh, and it was in a, a mythical, almost mythical, hangar, given the number of hangar 18. There are those that claim that when the wreckage was studied at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, it was drip-fed secretly into civilian research programs. And that it may have helped the technology for the space race, for example. Good Lord, right all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. Silicon chips, fiber optics, and eventually all the way through to the stealth technology that we see in the aircraft. That is a rumor, it's not proven, but uh, there are those that say that, you know, most of the technology that was found that day at Roswell are still yet to be identified and we haven't been able to reverse engineer it at all. The story got a new lease of life, uh, certainly in the 1980s. Stanton Friedman, sadly no longer with us, but he was the main civilian researcher of the Roswell incident. And he had no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that this was a crash of a vehicle uh, that was not of this earth, and that a cover-up was put in place almost immediately, one that is still intact today. And I think it was Stanton who coined the phrase, the cosmic Watergate. So he had no doubt that A, it was an alien vehicle, and B, there's a cover-up. How about the analysis of the materials? How about the autopsy reports? How about the eyewitness testimony from those who stood guard, those who carried it, those who tested at various government labs? There ought to be a ton of other paper. Stanton was a, a diligent researcher, and he would track down and interview witnesses to the event. He was also one of those that would be quite happy to spend days uh, researching through government archives to find documentation of one form or another. 
And he was literally, one, once he got his teeth into something, he was like a dog with a bone. And he did uncover a number of witnesses. He interviewed just about anybody and everybody. But what he also did was help spread the word. You know, he was the man that actually put Roswell on the map. And gradually, you know, the UFO story was, was out there for all of us to digest. Roswell, the town itself is, is still thriving. The, the Air Force Base closed many years back. Back in the 1980s, some documents known as Majestic 12 or Magic 12 were leaked. And it mentioned here that, you know, the bodies and other things were studied at a secret base. And, and of course, put two and two together. And that secret base is, is alleged to be Area 51 in the Nevada desert. Officially, at that time, Area 51 did not exist. And the only aerial photograph that was available was actually from a Soviet spy satellite. In 1993, a letter crossed my desk that would change things forever. The Roswell story took a new twist in the 1990s, time when the X-Files TV series was reaching its, its height of popularity. And I was working with Bufora. And in 1993, I had a letter from a company saying, could you help us possibly with a documentary? So I wrote back, it's the days before email and things of that nature, sent them some information. And now the, the, the company was the Merlin Group. The gentleman that signed it was called Ray Santilli. I spoke to him on the telephone and it was just like a general inquiry. We, we, you know, we were used to having such inquiries. After a number of months, Ray Santilli came out of the blue and said, well, actually, Philip, I happen to have film of the UFO crash at Roswell and the creatures being dissected, autopsied. Now it was always rumoured that when the Roswell crash happened that film and photographs were taken. So my, my natural reaction was, well that's a fascinating story, show me. If you claim to have this film then show me it. So it was, yes, I can, no, I can, yes, I can, no, I can. We happened to have an event in London that was quite near to where Santilli's offices were, so I invited him along. Then I met him and he told me, he said, I've been out in America looking for this film of Ez, Elvis and other rock stars. That's what my primary business is, is music. Then I met this, this old boy and I bought a piece of Elvis footage from him. And he said, before I was a, a freelance cameraman, I was actually in the military. And I filmed the UFO crash at Roswell, and I still have some of the film. Are you interested? Shook hands on a deal. So again, I said, well, show me. You come up with this incredible story. It's not unreasonable, you know, to say, put up or shut up. We went backwards and forwards. So in the end, I, I, I said, look, I don't believe you. You can't show me, you know. So in 1995, I was sent a, a, a video uh, of a movie called Roswell. It's just, just being released by Sony. Wasn't a big release or anything like that. Wasn't on at the cinema. And I thought, oh, what if that Santilli guy still claims to have this Roswell film? And he gave me his business card. So I rung him up out of the blue. He says, well, yes, Philip, but you don't believe me. I said, well, show me it. My name is Ray Santilli. I'm the person responsible for marketing the alien autopsy footage. 